All right, next up is Emily Schultz. Emily's gonna be presenting on case law developments and her materials are behind tab two in your materials. Uh, Emily often serves her clients as an advisor and as a trainer and also as an experienced litigator with extensive courtroom experience. After the viewing of our next clip starring a very pregnant Catherine Heigl in Knocked Up, Emily will further entertain us with a discussion of case law developments. Emily. We know what's under that jacket. You're pregnant, have been for a while. From my count, you're right around eight months. And I don't know why you felt you couldn't tell us. I'm really sorry. This is Hollywood. We don't like liars. I just, um, I wasn't expecting this and, and I didn't, I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't want to lose my job. I'm really sorry. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate you didn't tell us because, uh, you would have found out that we thought it's great. <laughs> really? So, we did some research. And, turns out, people like pregnant. Oh my god! The bigger you are, the bigger your numbers. <gasps> I was surprised, because I feel the opposite. Uh, we're gonna do a whole maternity month on E! Exclamation mommy! <laughs> You're gonna interview all the pregnant celebs. Really? Yes. Scary. You're pregnant, they're pregnant. You can talk about being pregnant. It just grosses me out when I know that people are pregnant. Because I think about the birth. Everything's so wet. And everything that goes into it, none of the gross stuff, but, you know, hopes, dreams, whatever. Uh, it's going to be great. Oh, my God. This is such good news. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> good morning. So I promise we're going to segue in that clip. Um, but welcome to the, oh, let me go back one, the uh, Academy Awards for um, the case law version, uh, infinitely more glamorous, uh, less commercials. And, and I wanted to let you know that you have me to thank. Uh, my household choice of metaphor was not the Academy Awards. My girls wanted me to segue in Frozen. <laughs> so you, you may give me a personal thank you for uh, keeping away the cliffs of Arendelle from this update. And instead, we're going to do the Academy Awards. So <laughs> the first case we have was flagged last year. And, and the big news is indeed um, the pregnancy discrimination and pregnancy cases. So that's, that's what we're going to start off, and that's why we watched that clip from Knocked Up. Um, we flagged this last year. The Supreme Court had uh, granted uh, or, or agreed to review it, and now the decision's out. So we have some guidance about it. Deals with pregnancy, pregnant employees, so all of you should sit up. It potentially impacts all of your workforces. Uh, in this case, uh, Ms. Young was a UPS driver. Uh, UPS drivers were required to lift up to 70 pounds of packages. Uh, she became pregnant and asked for the accommodation to lift only 20 pounds. Uh, UPS denied it. Uh, she ended up uh, losing her job, lost her health insurance, and uh, filed a lawsuit. Now, we also have in there the manager made some very helpful comments like you're too much of a liability, uh, not to come back until you are no longer pregnant. So there's a constellation of factors which makes for a good or bad case law. Uh, but the Supreme Court, the question before the court um, had to do with interpreting the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978, which provides that women affected by pregnancy, childbirth, or related me medical conditions shall be treated the same for all employment-related purposes as other persons not so affected but similar in their ability or inability to work. So the court looked at that latter part. What does that mean, people sim similar, similar in their ability or inability to work? And Ms. Young asserted that means pregnant people have to be treated like non-pregnant people. Well, you have to treat them the same. That is not what the court held. The court created a new standard, basically, for pregnant employees. 
Um, and, and that standard is, if you're going to deny an accommodation or point to a policy to justify not accommodating a pregnant employee, uh, the policy, uh, a plaintiff can challenge that policy. And that policy will be held, will be held to invalid if two things. One, the policy imposes a significant burden on pregnant employees, and two, the reasons for that policy are not sufficiently strong to justify the burden. Now, that sounds a little gobbledygook, uh, but the important thing is that's different from showing that the reasons behind the policy are false. They, they don't have to be, it doesn't have to be a bad policy, it just has to be not an important enough policy to justify not extending an accommodation to pregnant employees. So the court also held that a refusal, a refusal to accommodate a pregnant employee must be based on legitimate, non-discriminatory reasons, and that can't be, those reasons can't be just that it costs too much or um, that it's less convenient to do it. And the key question that this court looked at in the UPS case was why, when the employer accommodated other people, would it not make an accommodation for a pregnant employee? And to answer that question, um, and, and the plaintiff in the lawsuit uh, raised comparators to contextualize that question. And the three comparators that they looked at were employees who lost their Department of Transportation certification, or employees, I'm sorry, employees uh, who were disabled and received a reasonable accommodation, and employees who were injured on the job. And in each of those situations, in some context, UPS would accommodate those employees. So the court found, uh, or basically asked why, if you made accommodations in certain situations, did you not make it for a pregnant employee? So it's, it's kicked back to the lower courts now to sort of play out, but certainly she, can, she d was able to bring a claim. So the takeaway is significant impact with, with sufficiently strong reasons. Um, the 2014, this is less burdensome than what the EEOC had said. The EEOC in 2014 issued guidance with respect to pregnant uh, employees, and it, and it compared it more similarly to, to you have to treat pregnant and not pregnant employees the same. The court did not adapt those regulations. And the court also said, being pregnant's not a free pass. You don't get a most favored nation status. But what it does make you do is engage in something that feels a little bit more like an interactive process. You have to look at your policy, you have to see if it impacts pregnant employees, and then you have to see why you have that policy and be able to articulate that. And again, it can't be just because it's more expensive or less convenient. The EOC has issued now new guidance, which, per, which takes the uh, young decision into account, and that's a link to that, uh, that guidance, and there's also an FAQ for small businesses on the EOC's webpage. Um, courts haven't interpreted this new standard uh, very much because it just came out. Uh, there has been one case, though. It's a North Carolina case, a Bray versus Wake Forest, and in that case, there was a pregnant police officer uh, asked for a light duty um, and was denied it. She brought suit. Court said she can bring suit. And key in making that determination, uh, they looked to two other male police officers, just two. So that's a little startling that just making, uh, and those other two male police officers had both received some form of light duty after receiving on the job, or after incurring on the job injuries. So. If you're in this situation, this is new law, and sort of work, work through it reasonably carefully. Also, as an honorable mention for best short subject, uh, there was a case this year, uh, Rosie uh, Rosario Juarez versus AutoZone. Uh, this went to trial and is notable because it's one of the largest single employee verdicts. Um, th this was a former AutoZone store manager in San Diego, told her district manager she was pregnant. Uh, he responds by saying, I feel sorry for you. After this, she claims she's demoted, her work gets a lot harder. Um, and it goes to jury, it, it goes to a jury trial, um, and the notable part is the amount of money she was awarded. 
Uh, she got $900,000 in compensatory damages and $185 million in punitive damages. Now, that's, go that's in appeals, that probably won't stick. Um, you know, there, there's, there, there's lots of litigation around the fees, uh, but the point is people like pregnant. So um, be careful, you know, it, ju juries tend to like it, and pr pregnant people are sympathetic, so uh, tread carefully. So what's the swag bag? This is my, this is my metaphor for takeaways. Uh, so certainly look at the, your policies which in, affect pregnant employees. Um, we now need to look at the impact they have on pregnant employees and uh, what the justifications for having those policies. Pay special attention to whether pregnant employees are, are eligible to receive the same accommodations provided to other employees who are similar or dissimilar in their ability to work. And if there, we're not going to make that accommodation, is it basically is it justified? Are, are we treating people Are we treating similar people approximately the same, and do we have good reasons for doing that? So no, no longer blanket refusal to accommodate uh, pregnant employees. All right, the Academy Award for Best Production Design uh, goes to the EOC versus Abercrombie case. Um, this is, uh, was also foreshadowed last year and had to do with the employee or, or the applicant who applied to work in, a, in one, an Amber Crabby store in Oklahoma. She wore a headscarf to the interview and was denied uh, the position. And the reason she was denied the position is the company sort of self-perceived that she may not be able to keep up with their look policy, which is to promote, uh, purportedly to promote uh, East Coast collegiate image. Um, and so the question before the court, which the Supreme Court reviewed, uh, was whether she had to ask, whether she, she never said, I need a religious accommodation. The company sort of just inferred that. Um, and so the question was, can uh, somebody bring a suit for religious discrimination if they never, or, or a failure to make a religious accommodation if they never asked for one? Court says yes. Um, the, it ended up settling out of court uh, for 26000 and uh, 18000 and something in court costs. What's the takeaway? Employees or applicants don't actually have to ask for religious accommodation. The problem in this case was that the decision was motivated in part by her per the perception of religion. That is kind of a favored nation status, and religion under Title VII isn't neutral. You have to, it's more akin to, it's, it's favored, and it's more akin to thinking about it in sort of a disability kind of accommodation. You know, what can I do for you? Um, so you don't actually have to know, but if you're going to take religion or, perce or perception of religion into any employment decision, that's bad news. So that, that's the other large employment case out of the Supreme Court this year. Uh, moving on to more local, this is a Ninth Circuit case, um, and best original screenplay uh, is going to an ADA case. This is a case uh, in which, uh, it's, an, it's a FEMLA case. In this case, an employee was terminated after he requested family medical leave to care for his father's chronic high blood pressure. Now, he ended up uh, denied, ended up terminated, and uh, he brought a FEMLA suit, claiming uh, the employer interfered with his right to take family medical leave. The question became, for the court, was twofold. One, did high blood pressure really count as a serious health condition, uh, which would give rise to FEMLA leave? And then two, could an employee take FEMLA leave if all they were doing was providing, was being there, providing what I'm going to call present care? So I'm going to just sort of be with my father to care for him. The answer was yes. And, and the specific facts of this case drill it down a little further. The plaintiff testified uh, his father had had open heart surgery a number of years ago in part, uh, which contributed to his blood pressure. <clears throat> and he had submitted to the employer a very specific med cert. 
which, which uh, specified from his father's physician, he needed drugs to control his high blood pressure, uh, he, there was a duration of the condition, and he needed 24-hour monitoring to make sure he ate, exercised, and took his medication on time. The court held that he potentially, that, uh, that, that, that those things could qualify, and so he could at least bring a claim as to whether or not the employer interfered with uh, his family medical leave. Uh, they specifically looked at a serious health condition under the federal regulations in, in, involving continuing treatment by a health provider includes chronic conditions, so it potentially could include high blood pressure. And then the family medical uh, leave regulations encompass both physical and psychological care. So that is the present. I'm going to be here. Um, I do think that the specificity of the med cert in this case contributed to the fact that the court was willing to, uh, to, to hold or to let it go forward. And so the reminder is employers have a right and the med cert is your tool to specify exactly what's needed, uh, what, the, what um, type of care is needed. Uh, but in any event, be thoughtful because don't dismiss leave requests too quickly just because they you, you know, don't feel, you know, my father has high blood pressure and I have to sit with him. You may need to find out some more information. Academy Award for Best Engineering Effects goes to a case out of the Western District of Washington. This is an ADA case, um, and we're using it as our ADA reminder. In this case, an employee uh, had, was undergoing cancer treatment, uh, used up all the family medical leave she was entitled to, and then requested more. She was granted two extensions of unpaid leave uh, in order to continue her cancer treatment. When she requested a third, the employer denied it. And she brought a failure to accommodate claim under the ADA. Now we know we don't necessarily have to do indefinite leave, so you know, why did she get to bring a claim? Well, the court's big problem with this case was that there was no evidence that the employer conducted an, indiv an individualized inquiry into the extent of her disability, the impact on uh, her functions, and had, there wasn't any evidence of whether it would be an undue hardship to grant the leave again. So the court held she could at least perceive, proceed with the claims. So what's the takeaway? What are the swag bags? It really engage your employee in the interactive process. Uh, the employer's obligation is to do that individualized inquiry um, and, and to conduct an ar undue hardship analysis. So if you're going to deny an accommodation, make sure you've conducted that undue hardship analysis and you have legitimate reasons. And then tell them to your employees. Say, you know, for because of X and Y, you can't, we believe you can't do the essential functions of your job, and that's the reason I need you to give me a hard, a, a reasonable estimate of when you're going to return to work. Um, and, and really use it to facilitate the interactive process. And finally, training saves money. Half the battle is educating your supervisors, your leave administrators, your managers on when this undue hardship analysis and this interactive process needs to occur. So um, at least some issue spotting training for those folks uh, can, can get this, can sort of dot your uh, I's and cross your T's in this area. Okay, and then na next we're going to turn to what's upcoming. So this, th these are pr movie previews or otherwise Academy nominations for Best Dramatic Pictures. Um, upcoming uh, is, is a case out of the Ninth Circuit. This is on the, the Supreme Court has agreed to review this case. It's uh, Friedrichs versus California Teachers Association. And in that case, this, this case potentially has a big impact for public employers. Uh, the Supreme Court has agreed to review an older case which allows unions to collect agency fees from public employees who aren't agency members. 
in the specific, what agency fees, in the specific case, they're called fair share fees. And basically, the thinking is, if you're a union member, you might get paid a little bit more, and it's not fair for you to opt out of union dues and union memberships and still reap the benefits of a higher wage. So if, if you are going to reap the benefits of a higher wage, we're going to make you pay a minimum fee, uh, which goes to collective bargaining uh, costs. Now, the teachers in this case are saying, hey, there's not that much of a difference between collective bargaining cost and lobbying cost. And that, because I'm a public employee, that impacts my free speech rights and I shouldn't be made to pay this fee. And the Supreme Court has taken it up. And early in, you know, the, all indicators on that they're, they're, they're going to chip away or perhaps remove that entirely. So <clears throat> the, what's the impact? There are potentially dramatic implications for public employers and uh, employees and public sector unions. Uh, potentially, it could restore the free association rights of public employees who choose not to be union members. In other words, public employees may be able to opt out of being a union member. Uh, what does that mean? Well, one, it means a huge loss of revenue for public sector unions. And um, some, it, and it it's, has the potential to be multiplied um, because if the difference is agency fee or a slightly higher premium and I get to be a full union member, maybe I opt in to be a union member. If this is chipped away at, maybe I don't opt to be in the union at all. So there's really a loss of revenue for public sector unions. And then it's an open question as to what that means for the management then of public sector employees if I can't work through a union. Um, so that's certainly uh, poised to be a new, you know, news for next year. Uh, next, the preview of upcoming upcoming events uh, is a case called Spokeo uh, versus Robbins. Uh, this is also out of the Ninth Circuit. In this case, a plaintiff has brought a lawsuit against Spokeo.com, um, alleging that they published false information about him. Specifically, he says they made him look too rich and that maybe negatively impacted his future employment prospects. So, and, and he's alleging a Fair Credit Reporting Act violation. Now that's a very specific statute and the case will likely be limited under that statute. However, it has potential implications because the question is whether or not he had to show any harm. So can he just bring a lawsuit saying Spokeo got it wrong and, get, and said inc inaccurate information about me without showing that he lost a job because of it or somebody didn't hire him or he didn't get a call back or something like that. And, and why we may want to pay attention to that is um, the it, potential impact on references. It's possible that courts use that, use what the Supreme Court says and import it into other statutes or case law about how references are given. So it's, it's a helpful PSA to look at your reference policies, uh, make sure, uh, if you have one, and if you don't, uh, streamline how references are done. Who has the authority to give them and what information do you give out? It's also very helpful, and I have seen a couple times this year, uh, helpful to make sure that folks know about that so that independent physician groups who work in your healthcare facility don't take it upon themselves to give a reference about one of your employees. Um, and if we're not including people in that policy or at least not making them aware of it, we could kind of get sideways. And uh, there's certainly the potential for uh, a, a, an increased risk of liability to come out of this case. Uh, thank you all for paying attention. I appreciate it. I think I'm a little early.